Good morning, Christ Chapel. Uh, this is Pastor Jeff speaking. Uh, we hope that you are safe and warm today. I know this is kind of a rever- reverting to a previous way of doing services, but I'm feeling this might be the best way this morning, making sure for, uh, that you are safe and uh, comfortable. So this morning, we want to begin with, a, begin with a call to worship, and it comes from Hebrews chapter 10, beginning in verse 19. Therefore, brothers, since we have this confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened up for us through the curtain that is his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from the guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure blood, with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope that we profess, for he who promised is faithful. Would you join me in prayer? Lord God, we gather together around your throne, although physically separated. Father, we are united in the fellowship of your Holy Spirit. We welcome you into our various homes, and Father, that you would speak with us and to us this morning as we gather to worship you in the name of Jesus Christ. It is in his name we pray, amen and amen. We have a couple of announcements we want to share with you this morning before we jump into the word, and that, uh, first of all, is that at the conclusion of the message, we're going to be having communion as we usually do, so uh, we invite you to gather whatever elements that would be appropriate for you that you have handy for that, Uh, and you can stop this recording and do that, or you can have somebody run and do that now. Second of all, uh, again, we are truly excited about being able to begin uh, our children's ministries again. Uh, the plan is to begin in, in March. And uh, as Gail Soderstrom outlined some of the procedures and our needs last week, we're happy to announce that we had a number of people who signed up. But if you still would like to help in whatever way, please reach out, reach out to Gail. You can contact her with the information that you can find on our website. And those are the announcements that we have for today. I invite you, if you have your Bibles with you, to turn with me to Matthew chapter 16, verses 24 and 25. The word of the Lord. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will find it. Uh, it was just a year ago, uh, March 1st, actually, of last year, uh, when, when I came here for the first Sunday to come back as the, the uh, interim pastor here, and we began a study on Lent, the 40 days that lead from Ash Wednesday to the Resurrection Weekend. Uh, on that Sunday, I gave kind of an outline about the background about Lent, and, and so I'm not going to repeat a lot of that. If you'd like to access that, that, that would be great. If you weren't part of that or you'd just like to be refreshed and what the significance of Lent is, uh, you can access that. But in short, Lent is a time of preparation as we prepare for celebrating the resurrection of Christ. And it's also a time of perspective, of perspective where we reflect on our lives. It's usually marked by a time of repentance, uh, but drawing near to God. And one of the ways that uh, traditionally the church has done that uh, is through spiritual disciplines. And that may be a subject that's very new to you. And so, again, I want to jump into that a little bit. Emery White, uh, James Emery White, wrote a book entitled Embracing the Mysterious God. And in it, he gives us this exercise. He says, I'd like you to take a moment right now and look for two red things that you can see from where you are. And just take a moment to do that. I'll wait for you. And basically what he's saying here is, when you do something like that, when you look for specifically like for a red, a red color, what you've done is changed the way that you look 
at the things around you. You have, for a lack of a better term, uh, created a red mindset, a red mindset. And when you create a red mindset, you begin to notice things that you didn't see before. You become sensitized to the color red. Spiritual disciplines at their core are ways in which we sensitize ourselves to the person and to the work of God that maybe otherwise we wouldn't have noticed. So this morning, we're going to be focusing on these two subjects of discipleship and discipline. Certainly during the last 50 years or so, those words have become foundational for what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Especially in the the 20th century, that word discipleship became almost synonymous with a particular writer, and that was Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a prophetic voice that uh, began to talk about what it means to be radically committed to Jesus Christ in unbelievably tragic circumstances during the the Hitler's regime. He wrote a, a book, or it was compiled, called The Cost of Discipleship that was made up of lectures that he uh, gave to this underground seminary, and it continues to have an enormous effect on the American church today. He classically wrote probably one of his, his famous quotes was this, that when Christ calls a man, he bids him to come and die. Words that challenge us to to daily take up our cross, even at the cost of persecution and even even death. It convinced people that that following Christ meant a life of, as I said, radical commitment, radical commitment to his teaching that was specifically crystallized uh, in the Sermon on the Mount found in Matthew chapter 5 through 7 and also in, in Luke chap, chapter 6. A, t- a couple de- decades later from the 50s and the early 60s, uh, discipleship began to morph a little bit more into including issues such as social justice, uh, the care and the feeding for the poor, providing medical assistance for those who did not have access to those things, the issues of r- racial prejudice and, and uh, injustice, uh, issues such as uh, tackling homelessness and providing for those who were in need. During that time, Anabaptist writings kind of began to become to the forefront of of preaching and pulpits in America. Um, uh, Protestants began wearing crosses, sometimes even large crosses, uh, stating in part that what Bonhoeffer was saying through this life of radical commitment, it was to profoundly affect the way we interact with our culture. So almost uh, almost imperceptibly, the the shifting of preaching and teaching began to move in, in that direction. But also, when that happened, there was another shift, and people began to realize that they needed a, a, a source of a greater source of spiritual strength that was going to be providing provided for them a means by which they could walk with greater faithfulness with Jesus Christ. This inward turn began to re-explore some of the ancient traditions of the church around church uh, around spiritual disciplines. The practice of, of spiritual disciplines was almost completely foreign to to most Protestants, and so they began to borrow traditions from the early church fathers and mothers who who lived the ascetic lifestyle out in the desert, and then also from Roman Roman Catholicism and Eastern Orthodoxy. A couple of books that were pivotal in, in ter- people's understanding were books like uh, The Celebration of Discipline by a Quaker of the name Richard Foster, and also Dallas Willard wrote a, a really good book entitled The Spirit of Disciplines, Understanding How God Changes Life. Uh, 
This idea was not only do we need to be focused outwardly in terms of issues of our culture, but, but to do that, we have to have a strong inner core, this kind of spiritual soul care or spiritual formation. That word idea, that idea of spiritual formation comes in part from a, a phrase that Paul uses in Galatian when he talks about, he says, my dear children, in whom I am in great childbirth pains until Christ is formed in you. That phrase, spiritual formation, refers to this formation of Christ within us. That's a lot of history, which may or may not interest you, but I want us to kind of now look at those terms, discipleship and discipline, and what it means to us as 21st century followers of, of Christ. So discipleship talks about, it really at its core, is, is speaking about a person who is radically committed to the teachings of Jesus Christ and also to put those teachings into practice. In addition to Jesus' teaching on discipleship, the writings of Paul introduce us to this idea of the work of the Holy Spirit to strengthen us in this discipleship process. Paul talks about th such things as living in the Spirit, keeping in step with the Spirit. As we looked at last week, talking about the gifts of the Spirit and how they are connected in character to the fruit of the Spirit. So no matter how broadly that image of discipleship is in our thinking, it is at its foundation this idea of radical, radical commitment. Discipline includes the idea of effort. It includes the idea of a, a systematic practice, purposeful habits, of a, a regimentation of our lives. It's this idea that through spiritual disciplines, we develop a rhythm to our lives. In the Old Testament, the Hebrews took the lunar calendar and began to connect works and acts of God to specific days and times, and so their calendar was marked by this rhythm of holidays and high feast days. As Christians, we took the, the Roman, calf, uh, Roman calendar and adapted it to, uh, to our celebration of our faith around days of, of the year. One of those rhythms of observing these kinds of times was the idea of divine hours or, or divine offices. This idea of prayer happening at, in specific rhythms to our day of morning, midday, and evening. Uh, a number of years ago, I spent about six weeks in a, a Benedictine monastery in, in New Mexico, and they practiced divine hours. Now, my mindset at that time didn't include that kind of a discipline, but they would gather for actually five times a day for prayer, and 15 minutes before we were to gather for prayer, a bell would ring as a signal that it was our time to go and begin to make our way to the sanctuary to have prayer. Now, initially, again, I bucked against that kind of discipline, but what I found was that it did provide a rhythm in, in my day, that no matter what I was doing, whether it be helping out at the monastery or in study or on a hike, that it was time to begin to move back into this attitude of, of prayer. Instead of interrupting your day, it became this kind of thing to remind you what your day was all about. And it was marked by regular times with, with God. Annie Dillard writes about these, uh, this idea of divine hours, and this, in, she says this, how we spend our days is, of course, the way we spend our lives. A schedule defends us against always reacting to the chaos that is, that is around us, so constantly reacting and trying to deal with uh, the immediate or even our own whims. It, it, she uses this image, just this idea of a scaffolding on which a, a worker can stand 
and labor with both hands because there's a scaffolding for that person to, to stand on. Disciplines are, in, are meant to kind of catch us and remind us about what our life is really, truly about and what is important. The problem is this, that discipleship in and of itself and discipline in and of itself cannot satisfy our souls. Even though it, it may, they may energize us, they bring no satisfaction in and of themselves. I guess a way of putting it would be this way. When I get up in the morning, my first thought of the day is, today is a day to be radically committed to Jesus Christ. That is a great thought, but it's not enough at the beginning of the day, just to sustain me for the remainder of the day. Studying the teachings and, of Jesus and the gospel, we've become aware of what Jesus is calling us to when he calls us to be his disciples. He says this in Matthew chapter 5, verse 48, be perfect, or Luke 9, 23, take up your cross daily, or Luke 14, 23, any of you who does not give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. Now, understanding that those are, are very powerful verses, but they can be misuse, misused. They can be even almost in an, an abusive way. What God does, what does God want from us? Probably that's one of the number one questions I'll get is, so what is God after? And when I ask that question, almost invariably, the one answer that I will get, what does God want from me? The response will be this, obedience. God wants obedience. And he does. Radical commitment is an important concept, but it is not the sum and substance of what it means to be a follower of of Christ. There is something behind discipleship. So the question then is, so are spiritual disciplines the things that are, that are behind discipleship? I mean, Jesus prayed, he meditated, he, he fasted, he kept times of solitude and worshiped, and he, he celebrated, but he very rarely ever even spoke about what spiritual disciplines are. And yet, they're there. They're just not the focus of what he's doing. You see, because things like prayer, fasting, giving are, are so objective, they can, be, they can be measured, they can be observed, the spiritual disciplines can very easily become legalistic. They, they almost like barnacles kind of get attached to them and they become something ugly, something different than what God initially intended them to be. So because disciplines can be counted, they can be assessed, they easily then become a measuring stick favorably or unfavorably with the people around us. We see an example of that in Luke chapter 18, verses 9 through 12. To some who are confident about their own righteousness and look down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself. God, I thank you that I am not like other men, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week, and I give a tenth of all I get. Do you understand in that, in that little thing, you see three spiritual disciplines that have been distorted Prayer, fasting, and giving. Also, because some spiritual disciplines are, are, are so observable, they can lead us to a sense of, of accomplishment or superiority. I pray so much more than so-and-so. All right, I do this so much more often, or I give this much more. And they become this kind of, again, this kind of a sense of superiority because I do that so well. 
they also can lead us to almost to a sense of, of self focus. You know, that, that God exists solely to make me a better person. That uh, he shows me things in this world so that I can understand them and by implication I can control them. God is ready to swoop down and rescue me and be who I need him to be at a moment's notice. The people who fall into this kind of era, uh, uh, social scientists have, have called them attribution ther- theory. It's a game in which, uh, even as Christians, we would claim that we understand why things happen uh, at all times. We understand the meaning behind events that take place. Uh, for example, like this. Uh, so I'm driving to work. And I, and I get a flat tire. And while I'm getting a flat tire, waiting for the tow truck to come, a song comes on, a Christian song comes on the radio, and the words strike me that this is a song that my coworker needs to hear. So because I got the flat tire, because I was sitting by the side of the road, God used that to give me this song so I could give this song to, to, to someone else, and they could have it. Now, the truth is, there may be truth in, in that, but it also just may mean you need to buy new tires. See, not everything that comes into our life, we are going to totally understand its connection. We're not going to be able to connect the dots to everything that comes into our lives. The spiritual disciplines are important. They're, they're these well-worn paths that so many followers of Christ have traveled before us, but they cannot become the central focus of spiritual life. As there is something behind discipleship, there is something that is behind spiritual disciplines. I'd like us to think about just quickly these two questions. Number one, what is it that turns discipleship into a commitment that keeps us faithful? And the second question is this. What turns spiritual disciplines into a path of spiritual maturity rather than legalistic anchors? I'm indebted to a person by the name of Scott McKnight who wrote a book entitled The Jesus Creed, and he kind of explores this a little bit. He, he, he uses this example of, of a... Uh, of a scribe who comes to Jesus and he asks him, he asks him, what is the most important command of God? Putting it maybe in this kind of a framework, I think you can, without violation, paraphrase it this way. What is a life of discipleship? What are the disciplines designed to accomplish in my life? Because the scribe is a uh, is a Torah following Jew and Jesus is a Jew, he asks Jesus this question in a classic Jewish manner. And it's in Mark chapter 12, verses 28 through 31. He says this, he asks this, of all the commandments, and I guess you could, again, fit this in, and Jesus, you know there are over 600 commandments. Out of all the commandments, which is the most important Jesus responds, the most important is this. Hear, O Israel, that the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, and with all of your strength. And the second is, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no greater commandment than these. Behind discipleship, this idea of being radically committed to following Jesus Christ. And beyond spiritual disciplines such as prayer, fasting, study, solitude, giving, behind both of those, driving both of those, is this, the love of God and the love of others. Radical commitment is fine if it is fueled 
by love. Spiritual disciplines are noble pursuits, but only if they produce a greater love for God and a greater love for people. Without love, to modernize Paul's words, we become either fanatics or egotists. When Jesus says we are to love the Lord God, he is quoting the Shema from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9. They were part of, they were recited as part of the divine hours of the Jewish community. But most scholars believe that the Shema was, was prayed three times a day, once in the morning, midday, once in, in the evening. But when Jesus goes on to say that we are to love others, he is tampering with, with the, the sacred creed that was accepted by the community at, at the time. He pairs the Shema with Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18, and with, by doing it, he creates a new creed for those people who are going to follow him. He's not adding to or subtracting from the word of God, but he's taking two separate commands and he's marrying them together, inseparable, something that was unheard of at the time. Love of God is at all times in every way to be bonded with love for others, both always. Separated, again, they turn us either to, into fanatics or egotists. But brought together, they're meant to transform us, be part of the transformation process as we are conformed and formed into the likeness of of Jesus Christ. So in a time when, when, when Jesus adds to the Shema, it was to re-identify, to reform the identity of those people who are going to be his followers. They were to be people who love God and love others. And it was something that they would keep focused on every day as they followed him. If our foundation of radical commitment to the love of God and to others is truly central, we will live as God calls us to live. If we practice spiritual disciplines in order to deepen our love for God and for others, then we live the way that God is calling us to live. Discipleship is, is not so much about radical commitment as it is about radical love. The disciplines are not so much about spiritual maturity, but about maturing in the love of God. John Ortberg put it, put it this way. He said this, The true indicator of spiritual well-being is growth in the ability to love God and people. If we can do this without the practice of any particular spiritual disciplines, then we should by all means skip them. Spiritual dis disciplines exist for our sake, not for God's. They have value insofar as they lead us on this path to a deeper relationship with God. They, they give us the things, the disciplines that we wouldn't normally have in ourselves. In Matthew chapter 26, verses 40 through 41, this is a time in the Garden of Gethsemane, speaking of Jesus. Then he returned to his disciples and he found them sleeping. Could you men not keep watch with me for one hour? He, he asked Peter, watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. You catch that? The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. So most often we, we focus on this idea that Jesus wants to cultivate the right heart in us, and he is. But here in this section, he's, he's saying to Peter, listen, in this case, Peter, your heart is right. He says, your spirit is, is willing. 
you're just incapable of living out of that true desire that, that you have. Peter doesn't have the freedom to live the life that God call, is calling him to and that he wants to in his spirit. So what does he tell him? He says this in verse 41. I want you to watch and pray. He gives him two spiritual disciplines. Watch and pray. So it's appropriate that uh, today is going to be Super Bowl Sunday, and so I'm going to use a sports illustration uh, because I never do them any other time of the year. Uh, Walter Payton was uh, elected uh, into the Football Hall of Fame, uh, and he played for the Chicago Bears for, for many years. He was known as a fantastic runner. What some people don't know is that in his home, behind his home, there was this steep hill. And after every practice, as he practiced long, long days in training, he would come home and he would run up that steep hill. And he would do it 20 or 30 times each day. I know this much about football. I don't know much, but I know this, that it's not about running up steep hills. And he was not inducted into the Hall of Fame because he could run up steep hills. But what happened was this, that late in the game, when everybody else was exhausted physically, emotionally, mentally just wiped out, that's when he excelled. He would find a, a small hole in the defense, defensive line and just run for daylight. So he would sprint, and nobody else could catch him. And he attributed that ability he had to the discipline of going home after practice, long days, and running up the hill as fast as he could 20 or 30 times. Spiritual disciplines can open up a way of living, a way of getting in tune with God that we would otherwise miss. Gives us the ability to connect the, the willingness of our spirit to the battles that we often fight with our bodies. So as, as we walk through these Lenten days from, from Ash Wednesday, that, which will be a week from this coming Wednesday, until a resurrection weekend, I'd encourage you to, do, uh, to take a time of, of perspective and, and preparation to Take a look at some of the disciplines that we're going to be looking at over these, these coming weeks and, and examine them. Don't go out and try to do them all because you're going to fail. <laughs> you're just going to fail. Don't approach it in this legalistic fashion. It's Lent, and so I have, to, I have to do this. I want to strongly encourage you to learn about them. We're going to try to give you resources in which you can explore them a little bit more. We're going to be looking at disciplines like giving and fasting and prayer, silence and, and solitude. There are lists, uh, uh, almost an endless list of other kinds of spiritual disciplines that we won't have the time to go into, such as uh, worship and simplicity and community. But, but as we go through those, I, I, we're going to explain them, and I would just encourage you to bring them before God and see how he would have you spend these days that we have during this Lenten season. And again, it, this is not meant to be kind of a, a how to, to do this, but to give some kind of a framework to take the desire, that radical commitment, that desire to follow Christ and find a way that we can draw closer to God in communion with him and in our walk with him. Would you pray with me? Lord God, <clears throat> There's just uh, so much information here, and I pray that by your Spirit you'll help us sort through the things we need to, the things that you're calling us to, and the things that we can just lay aside. But Father, at our core, it is our desire to be faithful followers of Jesus Christ. And those words, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak, 
all too often characterize us where we find ourselves. I pray, Father, that we'd be able to find some of the tools that would help us to develop this regular rhythm of, of walking with you, of speaking with you, of communing with you. Father, and again, not that our lives would be easier or maybe even sense more meaningful, but Father, that our love for you would grow deeper and our love for others would become a passion in our lives. We pray this all in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. As we do each week, we take this time to come to the Lord's table. It brings us back to the gospel of Christ, to his work upon the cross for us, and our desperate need for him. We take this wafer as a representation of his body broken for us, and as we eat, we remember him. In the same manner, after, cup, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. As we drink, we remember the shed blood of Jesus Christ, through which we have forgiveness of sins. We drink together. Amen. Amen. Again, thank you for joining us today. We hope that you find our, your time together with us meaningful. Again, we invite you to access the, the worship songs, have a time of worship as part of your Sabbath day. God bless you, and have a wonderful week.